<clears throat> Don't forget to uh, sign in via chat. That way we've got a record of it. And I don't have to send the commandant chasing after you guys. Sure, you don't want that. That's a nice look, Mr. Bruce Ross. <clears throat> Still waiting for a couple of you to show up. How are you guys holding up? <laughs> good, glad, good, glad to hear it, Mr. Chandler. Okay, I know there are some weather issues. Yeah, live in the dream. <laughs> Very good, Mr. Schmidt. Uh, so uh, some of you are late. Uh, if you could not do that, try and show up on time. There, there are some weather issues certainly here on the East Coast. It's a, a pretty nasty, windy, rainy day. Kings Point has lost power, uh, but uh, I'm in Fort Washington and everything's working out. So um by way of announcements uh it's going to be usual class two lectures lecture today lecture tomorrow quiz on thursday um how did you feel about last week's quiz style do you prefer a more questions with a short answer or multiple choice without essay or are you good with essay questions Speak up, either uh, unmute or let me know uh, via chat. I like last week's. Okay. Well, it's certainly easier for me to grade. Okay. So you got, okay. Some of you like both, but more of you seem to like uh, last week. So uh, I think we'll. Uh, try and go with that for a while and see if uh, it allows you to, to keep up uh, with the reading and really do some, you know, a, a good level of analysis. Um, so I have been going through grades and many of you are doing very well. There's a whole bunch of A's, uh, which I'm glad to see those people have earned. And then there are a couple F's, which people have also earned. And that's because they're not doing their homework. And that's self-inflicted, you know. <laughs> so uh, you will be getting notified about this shortly, uh, and uh, you know we're going to have to figure out a way forward uh, for those of you who haven't been keeping up with the work. So um, <clears throat> otherwise, all of this uh, this week's material is posted to Blackboard. There is another discussion on the dis a thread on the discussion board. Uh, to address, there are two readings for this week about naval history and the American Revolution. Uh, 
and uh, it's pr pretty good stuff, actually. Both, both articles by a guy named Jim Bradford, who's down at Texas A&M, uh, a really good naval historian. Um, so everything's all organized, and we're, we're good to go with them. Gig them, yeah, right. There you go, Texas A&M. Fine school, by the way. Really, really good school. Uh, I also thought Texas A&M Maritime, the Maritime branch was, was pretty neat. But anyways, um, let's, uh, let's jump into today's lecture because uh, it's sort of complicated. Uh, let's see. Okay. Um, and the topic is sea power and colonial America. Uh, it's really more than that. This is really about the United States getting involved uh, in the American Revolution and what led to it. So this is stuff you probably got in high school and even earlier, uh, but with this weird sea power spin on it, uh, and let's see how we how we how that goes. So uh, does any of you? Uh, whoops, sorry about that. Uh, so, who just showed up? Well, we'll, we'll, we'll figure that out. Um, all right, so let's see if I can share the screen. Yeah. So we're gonna start off with this image uh, of His Majesty's schooner Gaspé uh, being burned to the waterline by colonists in Rhode Island, in Rhode Island's Narragansett Bay in 1773. And the story is, this is a Royal Navy schooner uh, that was patrolling the American coastline and chasing smugglers. And the captain was a particularly obnoxious officer, really overbearing, uh, really angered the civilian population a lot. Uh, and so one night uh, uh, he is sailing down Narragansett Bay in pursuit of a vessel he suspects is a smuggler, and he ran aground. Uh, and that night, uh, colonists rowed out to this vessel while it was aground and launched a surprise attack, and they lit it on fire, and they burned the thing. They totally destroyed it. Whoa, so there's Amer uh, British sea power being defied by American colonists. Uh, so I, I, think, I think my point is, is that the American road to revolution is very maritime. And in a way, it is all about how the British handled sea power in North America. And I would argue that they uh, abused sea power in North America, and therefore the Americans rose up against it. Now, uh, how many, oops, yeah, let's see, I'm not doing very well today. Must be Monday. So I just showed a uh, picture uh, of a house that should have been very familiar to you. Uh, let's go back to that. Who knows who, who that house is what, or what that house is? George Washington's. Yeah, it's George Washington's house in Virginia. And that house has a name, which is? Is it Mount Vernon? It is Mount Vernon. Any of you know how it got that name, Mount Vernon? Well, here's a hint. It's named after Admiral Vernon, the guy we studied last week in class, right? Well, how come George Washington's 
home is named after a British admiral? And the answer is, is that George Washington inherited this home from a, an elder stepbrother who had been an officer in the Royal Navy. And he'd served with Vernon in the Caribbean. And after Vernon sacked Portobello and, and seized a bunch of Spanish shipping, this older brother of George Washington had made quite a bit of prize money. Remember prize money from last week? And he expanded his house. And there we have it. He named his new house uh, in honor of his admiral, Mount Vernon. So. George Washington's home has this direct connection to British sea power. Uh, and I think that's uh, pretty remarkable. Uh, so why I'm mentioning this is because, um, you know, Americans benefited from British sea power and certainly Mount Vernon represents that, boy, Americans were doing pretty well off, off sea power. So, um, and the British colonies in North America, there are 26 of them, by the way, not, not just 13, uh, they're prosperous places. And the standard of living in the 13 colonies especially is actually higher than in Britain, which is a very crowded and, you know, there's a lot of wealth there, but it's concentrated in a few hands. It's spread much more evenly in North America. So uh, the colonies are doing well. But remember, sea power really isn't about benefiting individual people. It's about channeling wealth and power to uh, the government or the king, if you will. Uh, so for the British, that was sort of besides the point. Um, but the Americans had a very different view. They're like, no, you know, we, we have demands too, and we demand to be treated as equals. And you know, the result of that is gonna be that half of the American colonies in the Americas will revolt, and they will rise up in a rebellion and, and ultimately become the United States. And I think sea power can be seen as a crucial issue in this matter. Now my, uh, there we go. So I think you can see the path to the American Revolution as being a, a revolt against the abuse of sea power. That the British were moving away from that virtuous circle that Dan Snow mentioned in the documentary last week, where it was debt through you know, the Bank of England and handled cleverly. And instead, the, the British Empire, after 1763, tries to spread the tax load to the Americas as well. And they also try to impose more regulation on the Americas. And they're going to do things like use the Royal Navy to enforce new laws. Uh, and the result of that is that the Americans are going to become incredibly resentful of the British government. They are going to hate the tax collectors who live in the ports. These guys are called customs collectors. They're going to hate the judges, especially the vice admiralty court judges who handle maritime affairs. And they're going to hate Royal Navy officers who are sent over to patrol the American coastline and more. Uh, so, in some ways, I do think that sea power, uh, which should have benefited everyone, in America it comes to be seen as oppressing them. And it should have brought wealth. Like uh, this, this painting here actually shows Rhode Island sea captains carousing in a Caribbean port uh, and having a high old time. And that's how they thought things should be. But they didn't want to hear about regulation and customs collectors and Royal Navy officers. Uh, and notice how they drink. They drink their rum punch straight from the bowl. Uh, and they are having a um, excessively good time, shall we say. Um, the colonies 
before 1763 had been quite willing participants in the British model of sea power. They had participated in all those British wars. They had done things like operate privateers or you know, engaged in that form of warfare called guerre de course. We're going to be hearing a lot about guerre de course in the next week. Um, and, you know, they had even engaged in operations where they're launching pretty big amphibious operations against the French. Uh, in 1745, the New England colonies launch an amphibious invasion on their own against a big French fortress in what's now Canada called Louisbourg. And, uh, and then were upset at the end of the war when the British made them hand it back to the French. Uh, and then they had to go back in 1758 and do it all over again. Uh, so, but, but my bigger point is, is that this was mostly a Massachusetts operation. So the colonists sort of have an idea that they are capable of engaging in sea power as well, right? They are contributing to this bigger imperial enterprise of sea power. And, you know, they're happy like the rest of the empire when the, the British finally win this war against the French in 1763. They're delighted with the Annus Mirabilis, the, uh, the year 1759, in which, you know, the French are defeated at Quebec and Canada is conquered and the French fleet is destroyed at Quiberon Bay and there are other uh, naval victories that year as well. And the French threat is removed. Now, the problem for the British is that they have huge debts after this war. Yeah, they absolutely pummeled the French, but it cost a lot of money. And I think their problem is, is that instead of doing something clever, they go for the easiest thing, let's tax people. And the problem is, is that people in the colonies were actually taxed more lightly than people in Britain. And so their thoughts are, let's, let's spread that out. They, they are British subjects, they should be paying more. Uh, and that's where Americans disagree. My keyboard is just not very happy today. Okay. So uh, for Americans, yes, that's a picture of naked women. We'll explain that in a second. Um, you know, there are a lot of regulations which the Americans don't care for. The, the, the British version of mercantilism basically operates on these laws, various laws that taken together are called the Navigation Acts. And the Navigation Acts are not quite mare liberum. They're, they're certainly more open than the Spanish and Portuguese model of mare clausem. Um, but, you know, Americans couldn't sail into the Pacific Ocean legally. Uh, they could only sail, you know, they could sail to British colonies in the Caribbean, but they couldn't really trade directly with Europe so much. They were supposed to do all their trading through England. And, um, it, and these laws even restricted American manufacturing. So these navigation acts, sure, they promote British sea power, but remember, British sea power is all about, and mercantilism is all about enriching the state, the government, uh, and not so much individual colonists. So uh, the system isn't designed really to help out the colonists. They are considered to be subordinate. They're supposed to stay in their place. Now, the Americans hadn't really minded all this because up through about 1764, the British Empire had been very loosely operated. Yes, there were a lot of regulations, but very few of them were actually enforced. This is called salutary neglect. And the Americans had pretty much been allowed to run their own affairs. Uh, the British, in their search for income to pay their debts, are going to crack down after 1763 and start throwing taxes and regulations at the Americans, and they're going to resent this. So uh, this picture, uh, which is indeed, you know, semi-pornographic, 
It is uh, an allegory of Europe being supported by Africa and the Americas, okay? The women on either side of the white one, okay? Uh, what do you think the status of Africa and America is in this picture? Just un unmute and fire away. They kind of seem equal, almost. Well, actually, I think they, they seem subordinate. And, and why, why would I say that? Because the British colonized the Africa and America? I, I, th I think that the hints are in, in, in the picture. It's the, uh, the bands around their arms are sort of a, a, an indication, a fairly subtle one, of uh, servitude or perhaps even slavery, right? You notice the white woman doesn't have those bands. She's got pearls. Um, slaves don't wear pearls, <laughs> but they, they might wear a, a band uh, like that. So it's, uh, it is an allegory, and it all looks very prosaic here, right? There's no violence. There's no threats. We're going to see a, a very different version of this towards the end uh, of the lecture. So, so think about that. The British are thinking about it in this terms. Oh, you know, Europe, we're great. We're supported by Africa and America, and that's the natural order of things. Well, they're not asking the, the, the two enslaved women here, it, you know, do you want to be slaves? Uh, because I'm pretty sure the answer would be no. Uh, anyways, you, you, you get my drift. Uh, and it's uh, a bit risque to show this sort of, sort of image, but I think it is a good demonstration of how the British are thinking about this empire. Everything's fine. Everything supports us. It's as it should be. But I think the Americans especially are going to have a very different viewpoint. Africans do too, don't get me wrong, but we're, we're not talking about Africa much today. So part of the issue is certainly taxation. The British start to tax sugar in 1764. Americans get very upset. They protest. The British say, okay, we'll, we'll think about it. And in 1765, they come out with a new tax regime called the Stamp Act. There is street violence against this. Uh, American colonies come together to create what is called the Stamp Act Congress. For the first time, they're, they're thinking about things as a group. Uh, and they start coming up with slogans like, hey, no taxation without representation. Sure, we get it. You have the right to tax, but only if we get to send representatives to parliament. And the British refuse that. They say, nope, you are, you know, in effect, saying you're second-class citizens. Shut up and do as you're told. And that doesn't go over so well. There are more riots, and then the, the British come through with some different laws to impose taxes, which includes, by the way, sort of the end of that salutary neglect, uh, and now they're sending over customs officers to collect taxes, and they're sending over judges to make sure there's a legal process that actually supports what the British are trying to do. So, ooh, it's, it's getting a little bit ugly. The British are saying, okay, no more ni Mr. Nice Guy. You guys, you do nothing but complain. You don't contribute your taxes. We are going to send in the enforcers now. Uh, and that does not go over well with the American public. But there are other issues that were also bothering American colonists. And one of those issues is very much related to sea power. It's this issue of impressment. So uh, an awful lot of the Royal Navy uh, was crewed with sailors who'd been merchant seamen, uh, and the Royal Navy had simply grabbed them off the streets of ports or even ripped them off of ships. Uh, it, it, you know, at sea and said, you're going to be a, a sailor for the Royal Navy for as long as King George wants you. Uh, 
And this is a, a sort of horrific event where, you know, men who supported families, maybe they were fishermen, maybe they were a deep water sailor, you know, who knows, they just disappear. And, and if they couldn't write letters, you know, the family might never know what happened to them. And they're going into the system of really harsh discipline with a good chance of dying. Uh, so there's a great deal of resentment against this. And you get events like the Knowles Riot of 1747, which I think is in Boston, actually, where, you know, the Royal Navy sent gangs of men called, called the Press Gang into Boston, and they seized something like a tenth of the male population of Boston. They seized you know, hundreds of men, many of whom weren't suitable to be sailors, and they let those guys go. But um, Bostonians were so upset that they, they, they ripped up the town, and they actually captured some uh, uh, Royal Navy boats, and they dragged them onto Boston Common, and they burned them. Uh, same thing in New York in 1760. Uh, British ships start impressing people, and the town goes berserk. Uh, I don't think it was just Americans who hated this. There could be impressment riots throughout the British Empire. But it's, it, it certainly feeds to American resentment of that British model of sea power, which was only really supposed to benefit a few people in Britain. And one of the great examples of resistance to uh, impressment is a ship called the Pit Packet. The Pit Packet had been overseas and was coming back to Marblehead, Massachusetts. Uh, in fact, was just about within sight of Marblehead, Massachusetts after a, you know, a cruise, of, you know, a, a voyage of months when a Royal Navy ship stopped it uh, and uh, obviously with the intention of impressing sailors. Well, uh, the uh, unlicensed crew, if you will, because mates and captains usually didn't get impressed, they ran into the hold of the ship and hid. And the Royal Navy sent an officer uh, and several sailors down there to drag them out. But these guys resisted. And in fact, <laughs> and this is where it gets weird, they actually harpooned the Royal Navy officer who came down to get them. Uh, threw, threw a harpoon, went right through his neck, killed him dead. Uh, and now they get arrested for murder and there's a trial. Uh, and it becomes a big deal. And one, one of the big deals is a uh, young attorney by the name of John Adams uh, comes to fame uh, and uh, defending these sailors. And I think it's determined to be self-defense, actually, so they, they get off. Uh, John Adams, of course, will be the second president of the United States and a big advocate for a U.S. Navy during the American Revolution. So you can see, this, 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 is, this is big stuff. This is not a minor complaint. This is something that has uh, real legs that Americans resent deeply and will continue to resent it for a long time. Uh, another thing the Americans resent is that the British send over all these officials to rule over them. Before the 1760s, most local officials had been found amongst Americans themselves. But the British start sending over these customs officials. Customs officials impose taxes on cargoes of ships. Uh, and these guys are pretty arrogant uh, and uh, resented deeply. They send over British judges to uh, administer justice and make sure that the locals don't find all Americans innocent in the courts, which was very often had been what happened before the British sent over their own judges. They send over crown governors who uh, are there to look out for the interests of the king and don't really care about the people. Uh, and they send out British naval officers and ships to patrol the American shoreline to stop smuggling. And smuggling was really the big issue here. Smuggling was hugely common before the revolution. Uh, it was really a form of tax evasion. You know, if you didn't want to meet those customs collectors in the port, 
Well, you would simply take your cargo and offload it on a secluded beach and then sneak it into town without them knowing. That way you didn't pay the taxes and you didn't have to go through all the paperwork and you could make a pretty good profit doing that. Uh, and before the British customs officials were sent over, you know, local customs officials have been pretty lax, you know, so long as you observe the law a little bit, they were good with it, and these guys were usually Americans. Then the British guys come in and it's not, and it becomes more of a problem. And it is a form of resistance to mercantilism. We've discussed that before. Uh, and another Bostonian like John Adams is John Hancock, the guy who had that huge signature and flourish on the American Declaration of Independence. He was Boston's wealthiest merchant, uh, also Boston's biggest smuggler. Uh, and in 1768, his ship called the Liberty, I think that's an intentional name on his part, it's a smuggling vessel, is seized by the British Royal Navy, uh, and Boston has another riot, and they have a lot of riots in Boston before the revolution. Uh, and they get very, very upset. But nonetheless, the liberty is seized and, and the uh, crown courts uh, condemn it. And it's actually confiscated and taken by the Royal Navy as a patrol ship. Well, but not for long, because when the liberty is in Providence, Rhode Island, uh, the next year, uh, it gets uh, attacked by a mob of people in Providence uh, who seize the ship and they light it on fire. Oh boy, those folks on Rhode Island, they are just big on burning Royal Navy ships. They love to do it. Uh, so this too, uh, like impressment, is an issue with Americans and it gets, you know, pretty nasty. Uh, as a result of the Liberty Riots, the British actually occupy Boston with a British army and of course a navy to accompany it. Uh, and this is a very uncomfortable experience for people in Boston because the soldiers don't actually necessarily live in barracks. Um, they force the colonists to take soldiers into their homes, which is pretty oppressive. Uh, and those soldiers are there really to keep those Bostonians in line. And so, so are those Royal Navy ships. Uh, so, you know, things get really ugly in Boston. It's crowded uh, with soldiers. Uh, they're there clearly to keep the Bostonians in line. People are not happy. Uh, and there is violence as a result. Uh, 1770, some of those soldiers get involved in a snowball fight with some colonists, many of them sailors, by the way. Uh, and one of the British sentries uh, uh, panics and he starts to shoot into the crowd. This is the, the famous Boston Massacre. And the uh, uh, first American to die in the revolution is this sailor, Crispus Attucks. He's half Native American and half African American. Uh, and uh, it becomes a, a big deal, right? Americans are outraged that they are getting mowed down by these British and, and the British are becoming ever more unpopular. John Adams, by the way, also involved in this court case where uh, the British actually are not found guilty of murder. They are put on trial and found guilty of manslaughter, which is a much less serious crime. Uh, after that, you get the Gas Bay incident of 1772, where they burned that, you know, patrol vessel in Narragansett Bay. Well, uh, the British want to know what happened. So they send an admiral out to question people in Newport, Rhode Island, and they offer big rewards for people to come forward with uh, information, and nobody will talk. Not one person gets prosecuted for the gas bay incident. They all get away, right? So you can see what's happening. The Americans are starting to separate themselves and see the British as really somebody, you know, as foreign people. 
uh, and deeply resenting all these rules and regulations, this John Malcolm fellow here, who's in the picture, he's the guy, he's been tarred and feathered in this picture. That's why he looks so weird. It's a very painful process where hot tar is slathered on you. Uh, and then your uh, a bunch of feathers are <laughs> dumped on you so that you, you look like some sort of strange bird. Uh, well, uh, this guy was a customs official, and he was so obnoxious that he was tarred and feathered first in Portland, Maine in 1773, uh, and then uh, again, because he continued to be obnoxious in Boston in 1774. This guy is just a jerk, and he suffers for it. He en ends up living in England. He can't live in America anymore. He's just persona non gratis. Uh, so this picture uh, shows the Americans are, are beating him up, and the guy in front with the blue jacket is a sailor, by the way. So mariners are really at the forefront of this revolutionary movement, whether it's from impressment or the smuggling thing or, you know, beating up customs people. There were peaceful protests, too. Some of them remarkably peaceful. The Boston Tea Party, 1773, uh, is a protest against this tea the British were sending over. It was, it was good tea and cheap tea, but it had a tax on it. Uh, very low tax, but the, the Americans smelled a rat. They understood that this very low tax was the thin edge of the wedge, you know, a way the British were trying to gently introduce taxes, and Americans were upset by this point. They didn't want to pay any taxes and insisted that they not. Uh, also, uh, the Boston Tea Party is significant because the tea was owned by the East India Company. We've talked about that in this class too. It's a monopoly. Uh, Americans couldn't sail to India or China and get tea directly. Uh, they had to offer, you know, buy their tea from the East India Company. And that caused a lot of resentment too. The Americans had a good way around that. But they simply smuggled the tea, usually from the Netherlands. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, but it's a very orderly demonstration. In fact, uh, on one of the three ships that's attacked by these colonists, thinly disguised as Indians, um, they broke a padlock in the process of getting into the hold. Uh, and the American uh, colonists actually uh, left a brand new padlock on the ship uh, as sort of an apology for, for breaking the old one. Uh, and of course, there will be tea parties in other parts of the country as well. Uh, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, New York, uh, it happens uh, a lot, Philadelphia too. Uh, and again, the Americans get together to discuss these matters in another Continental Congress where, you know, they're protesting to Parliament saying, hey, you're not treating us as, uh, you know, British subjects with the same rights as somebody in England or something like that. We are being oppressed and we are upset and you must listen to our complaints. Well, in fact, things had gone much too far by this time, and the British uh, do not want to listen, and they're just going to crack down even more. Uh, and here's what they do. They, the British Parliament passes what are known as the Coercive or Intolerable Acts of 1774 as a result of the Boston Tea Party. And these laws are aimed primarily at Boston. It closes the port entirely to trade. The Royal Navy moves in and patrols really heavily. There are still the soldiers there. Uh, and at this point, the colonists have sort of had it. And they begin to buy gunpowder, mostly from the Dutch. They're buying weapons. Uh, and eventually, we're going to get to uh, Lexington and Concord uh, battles in 1775, where the British sent out soldiers from Boston to confiscate American weapons and gunpowder. And the Americans fought back, uh, much to the surprise of the British, who are pretty devastated, actually, by this, this event. But uh, this cartoon in the background represents some of that American uh, uh, anger 
at the British over the uh, coercive or intolerable acts. And again, we have a figure of America as a female Native American. This is the figure that's being held down to the ground. Uh, and, you know, she's being forced to drink tea. The idea is that the uh, Port of Boston would be closed until the people of Boston paid for the tea, which they never do. Uh, so she's being forced to drink this tea. She's being held down by the, uh, the fellow behind her holding her arm is a judge in his judge's gown and wig. Uh, Britannia is weeping in the background. That's the other woman with a shield and spear. You know, it's a travesty. The, uh, you see the Scottish guy in the kilt all the way over on the right. Uh, and on his sword is written military law which is seen as, you know, really brutal. Martial law is not kind. Uh, and the two fellows yucking it up in the background uh, are a, a Frenchman uh, and a Spanish guy who are sort of discussing this. But, uh, you know, this is an image, if you look at the other kneeling male we haven't mentioned yet on the sort of left-hand side of the picture, this is a gang rape. And that's the sort of anger Americans are feeling, that this Native American woman figure represents America, and she is being just, you know, she's being raped, uh, she's being physically abused, uh, and, it, and it's parliament and judges uh, and the military who are doing it, right? And the Americans are just in a rage about this. And I think understandable uh, if you think about it in these terms. You think about that British very prosaic picture of Europe supported by African America. That's how it's supposed to work. Well, I would submit that this cartoon is a closer representation, uh, certainly of how Americans feel about this, that it is just the ugliest of systems and grossly unfair and unjust. You know, there, there aren't enough bad words to describe this system. Uh, and I think the question is, well, what's going to be the role of the Spaniard and the Frenchman in the picture? What are they going to do? Uh, and isn't it odd that Britannia is sitting there with a sword and spear? and She's doing nothing but covering her eyes. So uh, uh, really pretty grim stuff. Okay. So to wrap up the PowerPoint, I think it, it, it can be seen, you don't have to think this way, but I would submit that it's Britain's abuse of sea power that leads to the American Revolution. And it really leads to a, a full-scale war for the British that is gonna cause them all sorts of sea power problems. Now, I wouldn't say sea power is the only issue. The American Revolution is a, an enormously complex topic. Uh, you know, one of the things, uh, a, a factor that contributes to the start of the American Revolution is that in the 13 colonies, the population is very, very young. The average age is something like 16 or 17. You got a lot of young, restless people anxious about their future. Uh, another factor is that, gee, after the British conquered Quebec in 1763, uh, there was no more French threat. Americans didn't really need British sea power anymore in the eyes of some. Others have said that, uh, you know, Americans are sort of paranoid and too jealous of their rights. Well, they're, they're certainly concerned about their rights and that's, that's okay in, in my book. Uh, and finally, uh, the last thing is that, well, the, the 13 colonies had sort of matured as a society. They had decided that they had the capability of ruling themselves, and they didn't need the British to do that anymore. So uh, that having been said, uh, who's, uh, who's got a question for me? Mr. Curtis, I got you covered. You're here. Anybody have a question for me? So what do you think? Are those images too much? 
Or does that make sense, that these cartoons? I think it makes sense. I think there, there's an argument there. I mean, it's interesting how they thought of it, uh, of their relationship between uh, the countries and how they were, um, they had to make the picture so um, obscene to get people's attention, I guess. Ah, I, th I think obscene is an excellent word in this case, uh, because uh, I'm, I'm not really a, especially PC guy, but this is certainly an empire set up for rich white men you know, for that everything should make them richer. And they don't really care about poor white men or anybody else, clearly. And I think uh, those images sort of display that. Um, and it's disturbing. You know, I, I think it is a fairly, you know, everything was fine till the British start to crack down. And then things get, you know, then, and then it, it gets revealed just how ugly this British Empire is when you start disagreeing with it. They really want things their way. Mm. How about anybody else? You got questions? Um, on one of the slides, it said the, I think it was some about ninety percent of the gunpowder was imported. Does that yeah. mean like the colonies were taking in gunpowder in preparation to fight? They sure were. Uh, and where they were buying it was in the Caribbean. There are European colonies down there, especially the Dutch. Uh, and uh, eventually the Spanish will get into it in the American Revolution. The Americans will import a lot of gunpowder through the Mississippi River, which was controlled by the Spanish at that point. Uh, so yeah, they're, they're buying weapons wherever they can. And the French very quickly get into selling weapons to the Americans as well. And this is before they've declared war on Britain. So what the, the Dutch, the Spanish, and the French are doing by se in selling weapons to the Americans, is they're really engaging in that gray zone warfare, right? They are making things very difficult for the British without declaring war on them. So uh, selling weapons clearly can be a form of gray zone warfare. They want the Americans to have success. Josiah Klein, very good. Proxy warfare, essentially. And I think you know, gray zone warfare often is, but isn't always a form of proxy warfare. So you wanna be a little careful uh, about that. Uh, does anybody else have any questions? Uh, I, I got a couple questions. Is is Mr. Hess here? I don't see Mr. Hess, and I don't see Miss Oppager either. Okay, so uh, let the record show they are not present. I will reach out to them uh, by other means. Uh, Okay, so you've got readings in the readings folder in Blackboard. You've got the discussion thread to work on. You guys, I thought last week did a really nice job on the discussion thread, uh, especially in your first, your longer entries. But you don't always have to agree with your classmates. Uh, there was a lot of, I agree. Well, you know, that, that, that's okay, but it's not so useful. It would be better to say, I agree, but you know, and then say whatever you have to say. Uh, and I know that's difficult for you, you're, you're very close, but this, I assure you, is standard college protocol, getting you to, to getting those within the class to question each other uh, just strengthens you all, actually. You're, you're doing them a favor uh, by doing that. So keep on working on that, uh, and I'll be looking for good responses. Uh, and I think you'll, you'll like the readings this week, too, which I think really plug into some of the bigger themes about naval strategy uh, that we've been talking about. And, of course, it's uh, finally getting very, very American. You know, I think you guys have probably been anxious to get out of this European stuff and, and into American stuff. And we'll talk about John Paul Jones and all that good stuff uh, tomorrow. Uh, any questions for me? Yes, sir. The only homework up till this point has been the discussion boards, correct? Correct. Yeah. 
uh, there, there was one that was, wasn't a discussion board. It was, what was that, a blog or something? Well, that was really didn't work out so well. Uh, but everything's been discussion boards. So you, you want to get after those uh, and, and stay on top. Because that's, that's a big chunk of your grade. Uh, the other issue is I've, I've been a little late in uh, organizing essays for you guys to write. I, I got to really think about that. You know, it's got to be doable for you all. Uh, so I am working on it. Uh, and we'll try and extend maximum flexibility uh, and empathy in crafting those assignments, okay? All right, folks, uh, we will talk to you uh, tomorrow. Uh, if you have any questions, send me an email. I have recorded this, I think, uh, and I do post those on my YouTube channel if you miss it. Uh, and that's probably what I'll do with Mr. Hess and Miss Oppager is send them an email with a link uh, so they can partake of all this stuff too. Uh, have a good night. Uh, be safe, and we'll talk to you tomorrow. Thank you, sir. Thanks, sir. Yep. Take care, guys.